The following sermon by Thomas Manton is an exposition of 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. We have considered the sin of those seduced by Antichrist. Now the judgment, it is twofold. Number one, delusion in this world, verse 11. Number two, damnation in the next, verse 12. First, delusion in this world. We take notice of three things. Number one, the author of it, God shall send it. Number two, the degree or nature of the punishment strong delusion. Number three, the issue of it, that they should believe a lie. Secondly, their punishment in the next world, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. First, of the terribleness of it, it is no less than everlasting damnation. Number two, the justice and equity of it, they believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. First, I begin with their judgment in this world. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Doctrine. That by God's just judgment, there is an infatuation upon the followers and abettors of Antichrist, that they swallow the grossest errors to their own destruction. To clear this, I shall speak first to the author, second to the degree or kind of the punishment, Thirdly, the effect and issue. First, as to the author. Here a difficulty arises, for God is not and cannot be the author of sin. He that is essentially good cannot be the cause of evil, and he that is alter peccati, the avenger of sin, cannot be alter peccati, the author of it. If he should cause man to sin, how will his punishment of it be just? I answer, as it is a sin, God has no hand in it. But as it is a punishment of sin, God has to do in it. To clear this to you, consider first, he that is the supreme Lord and governor of his creatures is also their judge. For legislation and judgment belong to the same authority. And therefore God is called sometimes our king and sometimes our judge. Genesis 18.25, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Romans 3, verses 5 and 6, is God unrighteous? How then shall he judge the world? That is his office and prerogative. Number two, God's way of judging for the present is either external or internal. As for instance, there are two acts of judicature, reward and punishment. In rewarding, God's external government is seen in dispensing outward blessings to his people as a fruit of their obedience. Micah 2, seven. Do not my words do good to him that walks uprightly? His promises speak good, and his fulfilled do good, yield protection, maintenance, and such a measure of outward prosperity as supports and maintains them during their service. David owned God's dealing with him in this sort. Psalm 119.56 This I had because I kept thy precepts. So as to his internal government and giving them peace of conscience and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14.17 For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Proverbs 3.17 Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. These are the internal rewards of obedience. And so also God often rewards grace with grace. As Isaiah fifty eight thirteen and 14. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Psalm 31, 24. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, 
all ye that hope in the Lord. Proficiency in the same grace is a reward of the several acts and exercise of it. So in punishing, sometimes he uses the way of external government by the terrible judgments exercised upon men for the breach of his law. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Hebrews 2 verse 2 Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Sometimes a way of internal government, by terrors of conscience, or punishing sin committed with sin permitted. Both these parts are seen in punishing both the godly and the wicked. As for instance, in the godly in the way of external government, 1 Corinthians 11.32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. In a way of internal government, the lesser penal withdrawings of the spirit which God's people find in themselves, after some sins and neglects of grace, are grievous. But the judgments upon the souls of the ungodly are most dreadful when the sinner is either terrified or stupefied. Terrified by horrors of conscience, 1 Corinthians 15.56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law or stupefied by being given up to their own heart's counsels. Psalm 81, 12 So I gave them up unto their own heart's lusts, and they walked in their own counsels. So that the sinner is left dull and senseless and past feeling. Ephesians 4, 18 Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. By the first... By horrors of conscience, they are made to feel God's displeasure at the courses they walk in. But when that is long despised, and men sin on still, then the other and more terrible judgment comes. For the giving up of a sinner to his own lust, and his losing all remorse, is the last and sorest judgment on this side of hell. Thirdly, as to God's internal judgments, the scripture chiefly insists upon two parts of this internal dispensation, blindness of mind and hardness of heart. They usually go together. Blindness of mind is spoken of in John twelve thirty nine and 40. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. All passages are obstructed, in which the word might enter and work conversion unto God. It was God that laid this punishment or blindness upon them. Hardness of heart in that famous instance in Exodus 4.21, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. God does not make them that see blind, nor them that are soft hard, but leaves them to their own prejudice, obstinacy, and unpersuadableness, and that when highly provoked. The former is under our consideration. Number four. To understand God's concurrence as a judge, we must not say too much of it or too little. We must not say too much of it, lest we leave a stain and blemish upon the divine glory. God infuses no sin, no blindness, nor hardness into the hearts of men. All influences from heaven are good. He conveys no deceit into the minds of men immediately, nor does he command or persuade men to oppose the truth. Nor does he impel or excite their inward propensions so to do. All this belongs not to God, but either to man or Satan. Nor must we say too little, as for instance God is not said to blind or harden by bare prescience or foresight, that they will be blinded or hardened, because God foresees other things, and yet they are not ascribed to God, as that men will kill or steal or do wrong, and yet God is not said to kill or steal, as he is said to blind and harden. And therefore, there is a difference between God's concurrence to this effect and other sins. Nor only by way of manifestation, as if this were all the sense, that in the course of his providence God doth in this issue declare how blind and hard they are. The summer other thing is meant by it is seen in the prayers by which we deprecate this heavy judgment, as when the saints pray in Isaiah, 63.17 Lord, harden not our hearts from thy fear, or David, in Psalm 119.19 Lord, hide not thy commandments from me. 
They mean not thus. Lord, show not to the world how hard and blind I am, but cure my blindness and hardness of heart. Keep back this judgment from me. Again, we must not say that all that God does is a bare naked and idle permission, as if it happened besides his will and intention, and God had no more to do in it than a man that stands on the shore and sees a ship ready to be drowned. He might have helped it, but permitted it. Now, besides all this, there is not a bare permission only, but a permissive intention and a judicial sentence, which is seconded by an active providence. Many things concur to the blinding of the mind and hardening of the heart, all which God wills, but justly. The wicked take occasions of their own accord to blind and harden themselves. Satan tempts of his own malice, but all this could not be done with effect and success without the will of God. There is a supreme power overruling and ordering all that is done in the world. Number 5. God's concurrence may be stated by these things first. His withdrawing or taking away the light and direction of his Holy Spirit, Deuteronomy 29.4. The Lord has not given you an heart to perceive, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear unto this day. Now when God lets them loose to their own heart's counsels, then they fall into damnable errors. A greyhound held in by a slip or collar runs violently after the hare when it is in sight. As soon as the slip and collar are taken away, the restraint is gone and his inbred disposition carries him. So men that are greedy of worldly things are powerfully drawn into airs countenanced by the world. When God takes off the restraint of his grace and gives them up to their own lusts. Now herein God is not to be blamed, for he is debtor to none, and the grace of his spirit is forfeited by their not receiving the love of the truth. He is so far from being bound to give grace, that he seems to be bound in justice to withdraw what is given already by men's wickedness and ingratitude. Voluntary blindness brings penal blindness, and because men will not see, they shall not see. And when they wink hard and shut their eyes against the light of the gospel, it is just with God in this manner to smite them with blindness. And since they had no love to the truth, they are given up to error and deceit. And because they despise the holy scriptures and dote on vain fables and would not take up a course of sound godliness and holiness, he allows them to worry themselves with a number of superstitions. But secondly, not only by desertion, but by tradition, delivering them up to the power of Satan. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. Satan, as the executioner of God's curse, works upon the corrupt nature of man and deceives him. It is said in 1 Chronicles 21, 1, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. But it is said in Second Samuel 24, 1, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he removed David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. How shall we reconcile these two places? God gave him over to be tempted by Satan, by God as a judge, by Satan as an executioner. Temptations to sin come immediately from the devil, but they are governed by God for holy and righteous ends. So again, 1 Kings 22.22, the evil spirit had leave and commission to be a lying spirit in Ahab's prophets. Go forth and do so, and thou shalt prevail with him. There is a permissive intention, not an effective. When the grievous spirit God withdraws and leaves them to the evil spirit who works by their fleshly and worldly lusts, and then they are easily seduced to prefer worldly things before heavenly. Thirdly, there is an act of providence which raises such instruments and propounds such objects as meeting with the naughty heart begins to blind it. For instruments, Job 12.16, the deceived and the deceiver are his. Take it in worldly or take it in religious manners, man's deceiving others or being deceived by others is of God. For it is said, both are his. Not only as his creatures, but subject to the government and disposal of providence, how and whom they shall deceive, and how far they shall deceive. So Ezekiel 14, verse 9, If the prophet be deceived that has spoken a thing, I the Lord have deceived him. This is a great transaction in the world, a sad judgment, not to be caviled, but trembled at. For man's ingratitude, God raises up false prophets to seduce them that delight in lies rather than in the truths of God. 
Number two, for objects. Wicked instruments varnish and dress up this cause with all the art they can to make it a powerful deceit. And then it is befriended and countenanced by the powers of the world. And so easily prevails with them who are moved either with worldly hopes or fears and have debauched their conscience by worldly respects. God saith in Jeremiah 6.21, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people. If we will find a sin, God will find the occasion. If Judas has a mind to sell his master, he shall not want chapmen to bargain with him. The priests were consulting to destroy Christ at the same time that the devil put it into his heart. Matthew 26, verse 3. Be an alarm by the miracle of raising Lazarus. Birds and fish are easily deceived with such baits as they greedily catch at, so God, by his just vengeance, orders such occurrences and occasions to take with a naughty and carnal heart. Number two, the degree or kind of the punishment. We render it strong delusion or the efficacy of error. That is, such delusion as shall have a most efficacious force to deceive them. The prevalency and strength of the delusion is seen in two things. First, the absurdity of the errors, and number two, the obstinacy in which they cleave to them. The obstinacy in which they cleave to these errors, nothing will reclaim them. Not scripture, nor reason, nor evidence of truth, but they still cry the opinion of the church and the faith of their forefathers, and will invent any paltry shift in distinction, rather recede from anything than once admit that the church hath erred. Like the obstinate Jews in Christ's time, they denied apparent matter of fact. John 8.33 We were never in bondage to any man, though they were in Egypt and Babylon, and were now under servitude in the power of the Romans. Though we prove they have erred and do err, still the church cannot err, or rather like the elder Jews in the prophet Jeremiah's time. Jeremiah forty four sixteen and 19 As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken to thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever goeth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings to her. As we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes... For then we had plenty of victuals, and were well, and saw no evil. But since we have left off burning incense to the Queen of Heaven, we have wanted all things that have been consumed by the sword and the famine. Such sottish obstinacy is there in men that dote upon their own invented superstitions and idolatrous services, custom, antiquity, practice of their ancestors, the authority and usage of their great ones, their rulers the generality of observance. This is their knot of arguments by which they confirm themselves, just as the papists plead for their superstitions at this day. And to make the mess more complete, they add the plenty and prosperity they enjoyed. What a merry world it was before the new gospel came in, when they had nothing but mass and matins, and all the calamities that have fallen out they impute not to their own sins, but to the gospel. Now when a people are thus obstinate, and measure religion not by reasons of conscience, but the interests of the belly, it is a sign that they are under the power of delusion, and error has more efficacy with such corrupt minds than the truth. Number three. The causes of it show the efficacy of error. Number one. The sinning of their learned, to keep out all instructions, allowing the vulgar only prayers and a strange tongue, and the scriptures in no tongue, and teaching them implicitly to believe as the church believes. When the Lord permits such guys to order the affairs of his church, his great judgment of obduration is upon them. Jeremiah 5.31 The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. Number two, when gain, interest, and ambition move them thereunto, as those masters in the Acts exclaim against Paul and Silas when they saw their hope of gain was gone. Acts 16, 19-21 These men do exceedingly trouble the city. And Demetrius, Acts 19, 25 You know by this craft we have our wealth. This is a tender point to touch interest. 
and when it once comes to this, they will proceed in their folly and defend one falsehood with another. For the great idol of the world is gain or love of money. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. It were a happiness that such kind of arguments did only prevail with us to embrace a religion that might convince others that it was religion itself that we loved, that our interest did not keep others from their duty, and that we could embrace a religion for the goodness of it even to our own loss. Thirdly, another causes pride of themselves and prejudice to others, lest they should seem to be in an error and wrong, and to learn of a few novelists. Shall they teach them? No, rather, they will remain ignorant still. Alas, it is not easy to strike sail and submit to the teaching of those whom they hate. Therefore men continue those first prejudices they have imbibed, and will rather live and die in their errors and give God glory by a submission to truth. Such a proud opinion and conceit have they of their own learning and knowledge. This cause also conduces to make this resolution more strong pre-engagement in a contrary way. It is disgraceful to change. Men think it is taken notice of as a great wonder, Acts 6, 7, that a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. But such wonders are not wrought every day. They of all men are most pertinacious. But God can of stones raise up children to Abraham. Now would to God these causes of error were only found in the anti-Christian estate. They are everywhere. But these cause strong delusion. Number three, the issue and effect that they should believe a lie. Two things must be explained. First, the object, and number two, the act. Number one, the object, a lie. That is either false doctrines, First Timothy 4, 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, when palpable errors are taken for truths. A man given over by God to delusion will swallow the grossest errors and fictions, and that in manners dangerous and destructive to salvation. False doctrines are often called a lie in Scripture as opposite to the truth, and yet such things are received by those from whose parts the world could expect better things. Number two, false miracles in their legends. A man would wonder any should have the face to obtrude such ridiculous stories and scandalous to religion upon the world. Number three, false calumnies against those instruments whom God employed in the Reformation. Popery is a religion supported by lies, as that Calvin was a sodomite and burned in the shoulder at Noyen for that crime, and a popish dean and chapter of that place who published his vindicate that Luther was an incarnate devil begotten by an incubus. I should weary you to rake in this dunghill, but I must close it with the general observation that anti-Christians will lie. Some among them call them pious frauds, but they are diabolical forgeries. Number two, the act is that they are given up to believe a lie. This must be applied to their erroneous doctrines as common to them all. To their false miracles and calumnies, not to the inventors, but to the seduced who swallow these things. All that oppose the truth do not go apparently against conscience, but be given up to the efficacy of error. They may believe the false religion wherein they live. Let us open the term believe. What is it to believe a thing? You may know by the opposites. Now opposite to faith, there is doubtfulness when men halt between two opinions. First Kings 18.21 if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. This doubtfulness proceeds from want of bringing the case to a trial and thorough hearing. Number two, conjecture. Acts 26.28. Almost persuaded. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Number three, opinion. Matthew 13.4. Has not root in himself, but durst for a while, and so on. Number four, firm persuasion. They will censor nothing, for if of truth, John 6:69, 6, we believe and are sure, and so on. But if of error, Acts 26, 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Fifthly, resolved adherence. If to the truth 
that is called receiving the truth and the love of it. But if to err, it is seen in men's obstinacy and zeal suffering in it. First Kings 18.28 Cut in themselves with knives and lances till blood gushed out. Suffering for it. For a man may give his body to be burned for an error. A man may sacrifice a strong body to a stubborn mind. 1 Corinthians 13.3 Though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits nothing. And persecuting the contrary. John 16.2 They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time comes that whosoever kills you will think that he doeth God's service. To apply this, Many that live within the kingdom of Antichrist, some are doubtful, some almost persuaded, some espouse the common prevailing opinions, others adhere to them with much false zeal and superstition. These are those who are given up to believe a lie. Application 1. Information. First, to show us the reason why so many learned men are captivated by Antichrist and yet live in the popish religion, for this is a great scruple to many, the answer is ready. The Lord has suffered them to be deluded by him, whose coming is after the working of Satan in all power. Revelation 17.2 The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. It is an intoxication. The errors of that state are plausibly defended and supported by worldly interests. There is a witchery of worldly allurements, and the intoxicating wine of errors defended and owned within their bounds and places of their education and abode, so that men have seemed to lose their understandings and not have that advisedness which well becomes a man. Possibly they may have doubts and checks of conscience, but the name of the church charms them, and worldly magnificence strangely inveigles them. They may know that the religion professed by Protestants is sincere, holy, and saving, but being allured by licentiousness or entangled by covetousness or puffed up with pride, are loath to change or are vanquished and astonished with fear of death and other inconveniencies, or it may be, do not use that advised and serious deliberation which is a manner of salvation requires. Four causes may be given. Number one, self-confidence. God will show the folly of those that depend on the strength of their own wit. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And therefore will bring to naught the wisdom of the wise, and destroy the understanding of the prudent when it is lifted up against the interests of Christ's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 1.19 Number two, prejudice. The priests and scribes could readily tell that Christ was to be born in Bethlehem when Herod sent to consult them, Matthew 2, 4, and 6. Yet who were more obstinate against him that was born there? They expected a temporal Messiah and therefore could not see what they saw. What was apparent to children was a riddle to the rabbis. So they expect some open enemy to, of the church to attack it by power and force, little dreaming of a bishop, and so on. Number three, pride. Many of the Jewish church believed in Christ, but they did not profess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. John twelve forty two and 43. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved not and hated opinion. Many may fear the Pope to be Antichrist, but pride and interest will not let them submit to a change. Number four. The judgment of God is a great cause that men do not or will not know Antichrist. God has not given them eyes to see, as Christ was not received in Jerusalem. The things of their peace were hid from their eyes. Luke 19, 41 and 42. He beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hast known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belonged unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. Number two, it shows us that the prevalency of this wicked one should be no blemish to providence, for the permission of him is one of God's dreadful providential dispensations. That it should have such success, it raises atheistical thoughts and weak spirits. It is an offense to the godly, as it is a prejudice to the truth. But God by this will show us, number one, that there are deceits and errors as well as truth in the world. 
much of choice, not chance, unless we should think this an antiquated dispensation to try the professors of the gospel who lived in the midst of pagans, it comes near to us. But he that condemns all religion on this account judges one man for another's crime, which is unjust. Does as foolishly as he that thinks there is no true money because there are some counterfeit pieces. Number two, that God in concomitancy with the gospel will discover his dreadful justice as well as his wonderful mercy by it, that we may tremble while we admire grace. Number three, that it is a great evil to be deceivers or active promoters of delusions, and it will not wholly excuse us that we are deceived, Matthew fifteen fourteen. Number four, what need all serious Christians have to pray to God, not to be led into temptation. Alas, what would become of us if left to ourselves in an hour of temptation? Number five, let us fear to slight the grace offered. Among other threatenings, God threatens to smite his people with blindness. Deuteronomy 28, 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Number six, what a ready way to destruction it is to measure religion by worldly interests. This bread Antichrist kept him up in the world and blinds his seduced proselytes to this day. Use 2. Is caution to take heed of spiritual blindness and infatuation, that this judgment fall not upon us, that God leave us not to our own lusts, hearts, and counsels without check and restraint, and may in part befall God's people. What shall we do to avoid it? First, take heed of sinning against light, either by sins of omission or commission, James 4.17. To him that knows to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. They will find it to be sin in the sad effects. Number two, take heed of hypocrisy in the profession of the truth. God owes a hypocrite an ill turn, and seems to be engaged to discover him before the congregation. Proverbs 26.26 26, Whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation, and usually it is by giving him up to some licentious practice or strong delusion, by which he breaks the neck of his profession. Number three, take heed of pride and carnal self-sufficiency. God may leave his people to dangerous falls when they make their bosom their oracle and think to carry all by the strength of their own understanding, Second Chronicles 32.31. God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. It is good to consult with God continually. Number four. Take heed of following the rabble, John 4.20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship, and so on. But learn to see by your own eyes that you may have sure evidences you are in God's way. Proverbs 24, 13 and 14. An exposition of Second Thessalonians 11, 11. Thomas Manton. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, 
familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.